Hey, thank you for those lovely introductions. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. <clears throat> so we put together a, um, we tried to keep it pretty short and concise, uh, the PowerPoint presentation to allow for lots of time to answer questions and have, you know, discussion to meet your needs and, and your interests. Um, but we also work some of the questions that were provided ahead of time um, into the presentation. So, uh, so the learning objectives for today are to describe key changes related to the MAID legislation. Um, we'd like to try to explain, you know, our, our thoughts anyways on how MAID can interface with the provision of quality palliative and end of life care as we both sort of have our hands in both hats um, or our heads in both hats, that was a bad analogy, um, and identify key MAID resources for clients and healthcare providers around MAID inquiries, uh, requests and support. Thanks, Catherine. So um, we'll start off by just highlighting what's changed with regards to uh, made eligibility criteria, who qualifies now, and uh, changes to safeguards that were in place and now what they look like. Uh, I'm going to be referring to um, two tracks, which you'll often uh, hear people refer to as track one, track two. Uh, track one is often uh, referred to describe those whose death is not reasonably foreseeable and those and track two is often described as those um, whose death is reasonable reasonably foreseeable and that is one of the major changes that was introduced with the new legislation uh, so what hasn't changed is you still the individual still needs to be 18 years of age or older they still need to make a voluntary request informed consent to receive may still has to be given after the individual has been informed um, of other means to relieve their suffering. Um, but as you'll see, the one major change is now uh, is the removal of the requirement that natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. And that's now created two tracks or streams uh, of patients uh, or individuals. And there are differences in the criteria and safeguards that are in place for both tracks. Um, for the purposes of currently right now, uh, made eligibility, um, those whose um, primary reason and diagnosis for requesting made um, being his mental illness do not qualify until March of 2023, so March of next year. Um, so they are currently still not eligible, but that will change next year. So another change is, is to the safeguard that um, there used to be a requirement that two people witness uh, the individual's request. An individual still make, needs to make a formal written request, but it only requires one individual witness that, um, that request now. And those individuals can now include a personal or paid healthcare provider uh, as the independent witness. And so that's a little bit of a, a easing of that safeguard. Uh, still two independent medical practitioners, e either nurse practitioners or a physician must confirm the person's eligibility. Um, the person still needs to be informed that they can withdraw their request at any time. There is no longer a 10 day reflection period for the track one or where death um, is reasonably foreseeable. Um, so track, I should also, can, I should clarify that um, track one is where uh, death is reasonably foreseeable and track two is where death is not reasonably foreseeable. Uh, so that's what created the two tracks. Um, there is the removing of that 10 day reflection period for track one or where death is reasonably foreseeable. Um, and there is now the option for track one individuals, so where death is reasonably foreseeable, 
um, that they can make uh, a waiver of consent with the clinician who will be providing MAID um, to allow them to go ahead and provide MAID if they are to lose capacity um, in the before MAID can be provided. This is only uh, uh, relevant and available to those uh, in track one. It's not available to those who are in track two or whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. So then I'll switch over to those whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. So those are all the requirements for those whose death is reasonably foreseeable. Um, those whose death is not reasonably foreseeable, um, they still need to make a formal written request. It still needs to be witnessed. Uh, there still needs to be two independent medical practitioners, either nurse practitioners or physicians who um, confirm eligibility. What's unique in this situation is, is that if neither of the practitioners has expertise in the condition that's causing the unbearable suffering, uh, the reason why this person is requesting MAID, then they are required to consult with a practitioner who does have expertise uh, in that area. So if it's a neurological condition, for example, they have to um, connect with a clinician who does have expertise in that neurological condition. This is a new safeguard for this track only. Um, like track one, the person must be informed that they can withdraw the request at any time. Um, unlike track one, there is a minimum waiting period now. Um, so there's a 90 day waiting period um, or period of assessment. So from when the first sort of assessments begin, there does need to be uh, a 90 day um, uh, uh, minimum period where the where all these assessments and consultations take place. Uh, the person also has to be informed of opportunities for counseling, mental health supports, disability community supports, uh, services and palliative care. And so while um, an individual in track one still needs to be informed of their options, there's a more robust requirement in this situation um, for uh, the person to be aware of and assisted if they would like to be uh, in connecting with these services and supports. Uh, the Practitioner also has to discuss um, and be reasonably confident that the person has given an authentic or appropriately considered reasonable options. They don't have to access them. They don't have to undergo those, those um, treatment options or, or services, but they do have to give a reasonable consideration for them. Uh, and then uh, finally, immediately before the provision of May, the person has to be given uh, an opportunity to withdraw their consent and also to confirm that they want to proceed. Um, and again, unlike track one, there is no opportunity for um, the consent waiver in track in this track two situation. And now I will hand it over to Mark, who's going to talk about uh, a final consent waiver and what that looks like for track one patients? Uh, so the first question might be uh, who's el who is eligible to sign the final consent waiver? Um, it's only those people that are in track one. So their death uh, must be reasonably foreseeable. Um, <clears throat> and they of course must meet all the eligibility criteria for MAID. Um, and uh, it's those individuals that have actually set a scheduled date um, so why have a, a final waiver of uh, consent? Uh, it's a relief, huge relief uh, for the patient. Um, uh, in, in past, uh, sometimes patients would decrease their meds to, uh, to maintain uh, capacity because of fear of risk of uh, loss of capacity to consent. So it's that fear, it's that fear of losing capacity during their wait time. Um, they, uh, some individuals, as the case in Nova Scotia, may have made, uh, have made earlier than they otherwise would have requested uh, because of their fear of loss of capacity. Uh, what this is not, it's, it is not an advanced directive uh, and it is not an advanced uh, consent for self-administration. Um, so um, they have to have, uh, uh, so the final waiver, um, it's a questionnaire 
and the uh, the one that I use is the uh, Dying with Dignity, and you have that in your uh, resource package. Um, so uh, I will explain the uh, in in speaking to some of the other physicians on the CAMAP Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers, some will offer uh, this waiver to all their patients uh, who uh, whose death is reasonably foreseeable. Um, I uh, I offer it to most, I would say, um, uh, and I haven't even uh, I haven't used it yet. Um, perhaps Kat may have, uh, uh, Dr. Ward may have used it, but um, I haven't had the uh, the need to use it yet. Uh, the other um, uh, interesting note about this is that you can change if the patient does lose capacity. Uh, you. Uh, you you can move the date up so it can be sooner that you don't have to wait until the specific date that the patient has uh, chosen. Uh, when can't you do it, even when a final waiver has, uh, has been signed? Uh, when the patient um, either shows physical distress uh, as you say you were going to the home and uh, to do a provision and you had your, um, you were all set and you get there and the patient uh, for whatever reason, uh, even if it's because of an acute delirium, they become fearful. They say, who are you? Uh, you know, I don't want you in my house. Uh, no, I don't want, I don't want to die. You, you have to, and I explain this to the, to the patient. I explain it to the family uh, that if that situation occurs, then we are unable to, uh, to continue with the provision. Um, uh, because the patient does have to um, uh, show in some way that they are not opposing to, to uh, have a medically assisted death. Um, uh, there probably will be some more questions about this uh, in the question period, but we'll move on from there. So in regards to uh, the statistics of MADE, um, as you can see from this slide, uh, the numbers are just climbing. Um, MADE became legal in Canada in 2016. Um, and um, like I said, you can see on this slide where it says there was about 2% of the natural deaths or of the deaths that have occurred in Ontario are now MADE related. Um, I will say as the Northwestern Ontario Regional Maid Coordinator, these, these referrals are coming in like really fast. Uh, last year I did around 180 consults and there were 53 uh, people within our region that did access made and have their provision. Um, so these patients have a choice of having the provision done at home uh, or in the hospital. And it's pretty common um, throughout Thunder Bay or Northwestern Ontario, all of Ontario and Canada, uh, pretty even split. 50-50 between uh, men and women, um, and as well as the location, whether that's at hospital or at home. Uh, the only location patients are not supported to have made completed um, is if there is a faith, um, Catholic faith-based affiliation. Uh, so our local hospice, um, they can't have it done physically um, there, and then they just are transferred either to the regional or home, whichever they prefer. Um, and then you can also see from this slide that for the physicians participating, um, whether that be uh, primarily family physicians, but uh, any um, physician or nurse practitioner that's comfortable and, and interested in participating and made are uh, able to, to provide those assessments for patients. Um, and then something else just to, to add on there that is a very common question patients ask. Um, when they do go through with MAID, um, that's not listed on their death certificate. So for insurance purposes or anything like that, um, it is just their natural death that's referenced um, and it doesn't affect their insurance in any way. Um, but if, you know, they were having a more private referral and they didn't, you know, want to tell a lot of people, um, we do also let the patients know, you know, the executor of their will may know some of that information about the made referral, but otherwise the entire thing can be kept quite private if that's their choice. Um, yeah, so I'll let Catherine go to the next slide. I'm actually going to jump in and take this one from her. Um, so I do palliative care and family medicine. Uh, so 
I do offer made as part of the palliative care that I do. There's typically the palliative approach, which would be, you know, a comfort based approach or more of a goals of care discussion about our healthcare interventions. And that can often start earlier in someone's healthcare trajectory. And then, of course, we have the more traditional palliative care for someone who's got a terminal illness um, and who may be approaching their end of life. Um, and then I think even as a subset of that, we've also got end of life care. Um, so palliative care, palliative care would typically be uh, a well-rounded, multifaceted approach to patients' care. So spiritual care, psychological care, physical care, symptom burden, uh, support to the family, trying to help with caregiving burden. Uh, there's a lot of home care supports, uh, lots of longer discussions and trying to um, target what the patient's goals are and will the treatments allow them to achieve those goals. Uh, with regards to MAID, uh, I do talk to many of my patients, especially uh, we, we had a brief discussion before this PowerPoint um, about the different options. And so I, I do present to my patients, uh, particularly when I hear that they're suffering, they can't go on anymore. Um, you know, they, they, they don't want to be bed bound and home ridden and uh, where there's no quality of life, I will bring up MAID as, as one of the three approaches to care. Um, I do offer uh, ongoing active intervention as part of palliative care, so still treating things, looking for investigations. I deal primarily with oncology patients, so ongoing chemotherapy, radiation therapy. Option number two would be more of a palliative approach, which would be that we do um, less intervention and more focus on comfort and symptom management. And then I do also bring up the op option of uh, medical assistance in dying. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so among the palliative care group, uh, there's definitely lots of support for medical assistance in dying uh, for our patients. I am at this point the only one who does provide the medications for MAID. Um, I think traditionally the thought was if you have good palliative care, you don't need MAID. Um, but what I saw pretty early on was that even with good palliative care, they're still suffering um, and that a good death looks different to everybody. Um, so there's some quotes that you can read on the slide. Um, but I do think that uh, most of the patients that I've engaged with, their families have been beyond thankful uh, that this is an option and that they don't have to watch their loved one go through you know, the 24 hours a day of suffering indefinitely until their disease catches up to them. Um, so I, I do agree with Dr. Woods and everybody in this PowerPoint presentation that it is a very rewarding part of my job um, and, and families are almost unanimously thankful that this is an option and something that they can access. So in regards to resources, um, these uh, organizations, Bridge C14, uh, Hospice Northwest, Dying with Dignity, um, and the virtual hospice um, with a focus on MAID, um, I send these uh, website links out to everyone I speak with that has an email. Um, I, I like to think of part of my role as a MAID coordinator is just information sharing. So the more information people have, um, the more comfortable they'll feel throughout the referral process. Um, often with families as well, we speak a bit of a pre-bereavement um, when patients do have an upcoming MAID provision uh, planned. There's, there's all sorts of emotions that float around with that. Um, and all three of these, or all four of these uh, organizations um, are, are well versed and made. And, um, you know, on the virtual hospice one specifically, I know they have quite a list of different um, patient stories and, and testimonies and things like that, videos pe people can watch. Um, there's resources geared towards kids and teenagers as well. Um, so, so those are really great. And I encourage everyone to, to look through those. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then for the, the clinicians or, or nurse practitioners themselves uh, more directly, so the all, all of the main forms, um, so your formal consent, which is the clinician aid A, um, or if you're the BAID provider, clinician aid B, the secondary assessor, the clinician aid C, those are all found on uh, the main uh, provincial website. Um, and, and then from there, uh, the MAID House was an organization created 
um, for those that maybe don't have, uh, if they're not wanting to go into hospital and, and they would like a more home environment, I, I believe that's down in the Toronto area. Um, and then the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers, um, I'm also a member of that. Uh, I think that is probably one of the most helpful um, resources for any uh, physician or nurse practitioner thinking about MAID, um, through the legislative changes that happened last year, they were our greatest link. Um, there's members throughout all of Canada. Uh, there was just a case sharing co uh, conference uh, last night. Um, and then they have the all sorts of uh, different things, usually monthly, um, or a spring or a fall forum, something like that. Um, and uh, they are accredited. Um, so so ongoing educational credits are available that way through there as well. Um, and then the other resources are just more uh, focused directly on, uh, depending on whether you're the nurse practitioner or physician. Um, then I think it's over to you, Catherine. Okay, thank you. Uh, so one of the questions that came through uh, was related to uh, just support for the clinician and for the team that is supporting medical assistance in dying, you know, recognizing that in a lot of areas, it's still um, fairly new or, you know, it doesn't happen that frequently. Um, again, it sort of depends on geography and just how well oiled, you know, the machine is um, in terms of all the, the players knowing their roles. So I guess, you know, in terms of talking about peer led debriefs, there can be two sides, like there's sort of the um, organizational communication, you know, making sure that everybody knows their role side of debrief, but then there's also like the emotional side um, in terms of being able to provide support to one another um, in like a, you know, a safe and open environment. Um, so I wanted to share this resource that was developed um, through Lakehead University. It is meant, um, or it was written really for long-term care and deaths in long-term care, but really the, the tools within it are all totally applicable to medical assistance in dying or, or any death in terms of supporting the team to come together to talk about, you know, either the sort of the functional side, um, you know, supplies and, and medications and, um, you know, who is signing what and, you know, like the practical side um, to have that sort of debrief or the emotional side. Um, and I think I just really wanted to emphasize that this could, this can be led by anybody and it can be requested by anybody. So, you know, for any, for any death or any death through medical assistance and dying, um, you know, these resources are there and really, I, you know, I would hope that your organization would support you um, to come together as a group to talk about, you know, what went well, what could be improved on, um, any, you know, ideas, uh, and then also, of course, that emotional side, like that check-in, how are you doing, how are you feeling, um, you know, and just be able to provide that support. Amber, I think it's back to you. Yeah, yeah. So in regards to um, contact, um, so any, like for for anyone really, they can call um, me directly. Uh, so whether that's through the 1-800 number um, or, or calling reception at, at home care that way. Um, also referrals, um, if you're the physician or nurse practitioner, they can come just directly to the home care office uh, and then I'll get the task and, and follow up with the patient from there. Um, there's also always the option for uh, the provincial coordination service, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so my general, uh, I always start with the consult with the patient. Um, and then if the patient is ready to move forward at that time, that's where we, I help a system with getting the clinician aid signed um, and then reaching out to our local physician working group to see who is available. Um, and, and if I don't hear back from anybody within about a week, that's where then I also register the patient with the provincial service. Um, and, and they're usually more able to come in on a, on a secondary assessment level, usually virtually, um, but, but it's, a, it's a really great service and anybody can call into that too. So, you know, it doesn't always just have to be, uh, it's nice to have somebody local, um, but sometimes, you know, I have had patients that have 
you know, been on the internet and found some information and they called the provincial number and then got directed uh, to me that way. Um, next slide. Um, so, so the big changes for, for the May legislation that came into play last March, um, you know, though that's kind of the main focus of, of everybody's questions is what were those changes? How does that affect me? How does that affect my practice? How do I help uh, my patients? And, you know, the track two referrals are the ones with the most questions um, because when their natural death is not reasonably foreseeable, um, you know, we really want to make sure we're fully supporting that patient um, just to, you know, make sure that their, their suffering is relieved and, and like Michelle had said, there is a 90 day assessment time period. Um, but, but even after that, you know, if they had supports and, and wanted to change their mind, that's always a part of the program. A lot of patients will put a pause, they'll put a stop. They'll say, you know what, I got some special appointments, maybe not focus on that right now. I'll think about this later. Thanks for the information. And that's great, right? Like it's all about just making sure that everybody knows how and when. Um, another um, thing I was, we were speaking of prior to this, where just in regards to when would you bring this up with your patients, right? And uh, there was a physician um, on one of the CAM app uh, forums that had mentioned, you know, in his family practice, anybody, as soon as they turn 75, they have a discussion um, just to say, you know, when, if or when you were to have a deterioration, would you like me to bring up the topic of MAID? And so they're talking about it in a very neutral time frame. The patient isn't sick and they're not recommending it or anything like that. They're just talking about options. Um, but so that was where for him, he found, you know, right then you got a pretty good idea of how your patient feels. And then he'd just make a note of that in their chart. So if or when a deterioration happened, he would know, oh, this person is not interested in learning more about MAID. Or, okay, maybe they were. This would be the time to, to speak more openly and more detailed about it. Um, and then in regards to the resources, um, uh, those are all uh, attached. Uh, they were sent out for, for resources for that. And, and then myself as a link as well, you know, like I, I speak with everyone and answer all sorts of questions and direct everybody uh, best I can to, to get the information they need. Okay, thanks, Amber. Um, so you'll note for those of you that had sent in questions that have already been answered that, you know, we did do our best to incorporate some of them into the presentation, uh, but then these are a number of the remaining questions. Um, so we thought we would just go through and um, answer them as best we can. I cannot see the chat, so I don't know um, if there are more questions coming up in the chat. Um, maybe I'll just pause. Right. Are, are there questions in the chat that we should address? Yeah. I see uh, Barbara uh, Kemeny has a question. Uh, can you comment on clients' uh, diagnosis with Alzheimer's dementia? Track two, is this being uh, discussed as an option? Uh, yes, it is. It came up in the uh, camp and some of the CAM uh, forums. Uh, as long as it's early on in uh, their diagnosis uh, and they're clear, uh, they have capacity to consent, they understand. They, but they have to have uh, the diagnosis. It can't be, as we've uh, discussed, can't be an advanced directive. Um, so yes, P people can have early uh, stages of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. They would be a track two. Um, and uh, second question is, as the patient's family doctor, uh, can I be an assessor or a provider? Uh, yes, it's often where um, uh, individual, uh, where family doctors or nurse practitioners will start. They have a patient uh, who uh, has requested uh, a medically assisted death and they will uh, be a secondary assessor if they haven't done it before. Uh, and we have had situations where uh, they've, uh, you know, kind of jumped right in with mentoring and being a, a first assessor. So absolutely, those are the ideal situations. Thank you, Mark. Were there any other questions there? Uh, yes, I can see uh, once a patient has completed uh, Clinician 8A, where is it submitted? Um, it's uh, 
Uh, Amber, you can answer that. Yeah, so um, always uh, we request that it be submitted to their family physician. Um, I also put a request out to the family physician to see if they're willing, able to participate. Um, but if you were just coming on as a second assessor or provider for someone that you're not already attached to that patient's file, that's where you can fax it right to myself. Um, and then I will hold uh, it in their home care file and, and then fax it to whoever else uh, needs to have it, which is very helpful as well um, because sometimes things happen and people are out of town, right? So it is nice um, if it's uploaded in their file or if I have a copy of it and then I'm able to help, you know, just logistically get that paperwork where it needs to go if there was a, a quick deterioration. Um, and sometimes we'll need to have like a different provider come on board for a referral if there was a quick decline. Um, and then I see there's also a question in regards to, uh, do you notice service delays in terms of securing nursing support for home and community care support services for MAID provision? How do you work around that? Example, starting IV lines for the purpose of MAID. So this is a big deal. <laughs> uh, and the more time we have to logistically arrange that, the better. Um, so, you know, perfect world scenario, we'd have a minimum of three days notice. Um, and so we all know that COVID is still here and it is putting a huge stress on our system. So perfect world scenario, three days notice, right? Especially if the patient doesn't even have nursing involved already. And, and if they do have nursing involved, um, it, it's helpful, but sometimes it doesn't fix the, the issue because every single person involved in a made referral at every step of the way needs to feel comfortable and aware of what they're doing, right? So you may have the patient's primary nurse that isn't comfortable with MAID. And so they'll say, I'm well-versed in inserting IVs, but I will not be the one to participate in putting IVs in for that purpose. Um, so that's where the nursing providers, you know, they really have to, to speak with their staff, see who's comfortable, see who's comfortable to assist the physician with that provision. Um, so like we, we definitely try our best. I'll say all the nursing providers go above and beyond to prioritize MAID provisions. Um, but if it were to come down to the wire and there wasn't a nurse in the community available, the provision would have to be moved to the hospital out of safety um, because we need to be able to get those IVs in. And the, the physician, you know, depending on their, some physicians are comfortable doing IVs, most are not. Um, so having that community nursing support is really important. And, and that's where I come in to help work with that. I work with the, the management of the service providers to confirm what's going on and, and go from there. Um, I see there was another question in regards to an interview guide for assessments. Um, the College of Physicians has put out a made handbook. Um, it's from 2018, so it is a bit outdated. It still reflects things, the 10 day wait period requiring two witnesses. It doesn't speak of track two because that wasn't created yet at that time. Um, but that guide is very helpful in kind of detailing out capacity assessments, what type of health history you're looking for. You're essentially doing like a full chart review, health history, social, physical, when you're completing these assessments. So yes, there's the checkbox forms of the clinician A, B, or C, but then the physicians or nurse practitioners also have to do a full write-up as well. And I believe and Dr. Woods um, and Dr. Ward would also probably be really great resources if a clinician had questions about um, how to proceed with an assessment um, and perhaps might be able to share tools and resources that they use. That's right. Yeah, mentorship is the, probably the biggest piece of this, especially if you're getting, I mean, even once you're well-versed is, you know, having, that's where CAMAP is great, but locally, yeah, definitely Dr. Ward or Dr. Woods or, you know, and I always put that request out as well to the group of who's available, just different networking situations. I, I can also add that um, in one of the recent, um, I think it was the November session that we had with, uh, uh, with, you know, that was CAMAP supported, the educational session. Uh, Ed Wise, who's on the executive, uh, did provide in his slides uh, his form that he uses, and he said he, he was welcome to share that. Um, so if you go on to the CAMAP um, website, you can, you can find that. Uh, I have a copy of it from his previous slide presentation. But uh, I mean, basically, it's a made assessment report and you can, oh, you probably can't see it, but um, 
it's quite detailed, uh, you know, basically starts off with, uh, you know, describe the condition and then describe your reasons uh, and describe your symptoms. And then why have you asked for, uh, why are you requesting MAID? And then documenting uh, as the chart review, the, the patient's history, uh, kind of telling the story about why uh, someone has come to this decision and the supporting documentation. And that's what the coroner's office looks for as well. You have to send in a copy of uh, the pertinent consult notes, imaging, uh, pathology reports. Um, and it, when I do my uh, assessment, uh, once it's done, I go back and I, um, well, before I do it, I, I do a review of the documents. And then uh, if I notice that uh, they, the documentation doesn't align with the patient's request. I have, um, I've on more than one occasion gone back to one of the providers or one of the consultants, for example, an oncology patient where they're uh, actively receiving uh, chemo and uh, the, the latest consult note doesn't indicate that they've changed their mind about uh, proceeding with it. I'll go back and I'll say, can you please follow up with your oncologist uh, or I'll call the oncologist and let them know that the patient has made a made request and then they'll update their, their note so that the consult notes align with what the patient has requested. So perhaps we'll switch into the submitted questions. Amber, I think you were going to speak to this first question. Um, so uh, is MAID accepted in the Indigenous culture and is MAID being done on Northern First Nation communities? Um, so I definitely have um, had Indigenous um, patients that have requested MAID and, and proceeded with that. Myself, I have not participated in arranging for that to be completed on reserve. Um, but I'm, I'm sure if that was something that the patient wanted, we could logistically try to figure that out. And it would just be working with uh, their band and their, their current, you know, home care nurses that they have affiliated with their band. Um, but generally, my, my understanding is that it is okay. Uh, and then the second question is there... Um from a bioethics point of view or a clinical point of view, in your opinion, what is the most significant change to the legislation? From a bioethics perspective, I think uh, the two most significant changes is the addition of the, the quote unquote track two or where death is not reasonably foreseeable. Um, I think it's raised a number of different questions um, anywhere from um, the clinician asking, you know, do I want to participate or under what circumstances would I like to participate um, to just logistical questions, um, as well as, um, you know, what is my responsibility in terms of um, accelerating a referral? Um, for example, um, a, a specialist might have a one year wait time. Um, and uh, where, you know, where's the, where's the, the balance between um, ensuring that this person has access to that specialist or is able to consult with that specialist, but recognizing that getting this person in sooner might mean displacing another individual. And so, you know, ethical issues around that have been, have come up. I think the other um, aspect that isn't especially relevant right now, but will be next year is uh, when uh, people whose primary uh, reason for requesting MAID and accessing MAID is mental illness will also um, bring up a number of ethical questions and um, will be uh, a significant area of discussion. Uh, just looking uh, I can Oh, go ahead. Can, go ahead. I, I was just going to comment on the third question. Uh, is the staff increasing as I'm concerned about burnout of a small working group? Uh, yes, the numbers are increasing. Uh, there have been um, more uh, physicians coming on board, including specialists. Um, and um, as, I, as I think as uh, more people become uh, familiar, familiar um, uh, th this issue of burnout has been raised in a number of the, number of the smaller communities, um, and uh, you know when those situations uh, occur, uh, 
you know, just to step back, take a little bit of time. I know I took a year, uh, almost a year off myself at the start of um, uh, the start of COVID. And then I came back in uh, a year later. And, uh, but it's now, uh, I would say it, it's an issue that you, you should be aware of, but uh, it's not a, not a reason that I would say in my experience to deter someone from coming forward. You can determine the amount that you want to participate. Uh, you can say, I'll be a participant for my own patients. I'll be a second assessor, but I'm not ready to be a first assessor. And then gradually as your level of comfort increases, you can do more provisions. So there's a way around avoiding the burnout aspect. I also feel as a new physician, but also a new provider and assessor that um, it's very daunting at first, um, but once you start doing them and get involved, uh, certainly the second assessment is roughly in the, um, it's roughly a, a longer consult where you have to touch on a few different points, um, but we do admission history and physicals if we work, work in the hospital. Um, and so I, I know for me, I've definitely started talking to my newer colleagues and my other colleagues about my involvement and, and trying to help break down some of those barriers. I do think there is interest, certainly I find among some of the interdisciplinary team as well to become more involved. Um, and, and I think it's mostly met with a really positive experience. I think uh, just talking about it more and, and helping to address those barriers is also going to help increase the number of professionals and physicians doing it. So I wanna tackle uh, the next question. We've, we've sort of touched on it, but I think it would be worthwhile to, um, to answer again. Mark, did you wanna take that one? Uh, yes, I can. Consent. Yeah. So as the patient signs a written request and is competent at the time, but by the time they decide to have made performed, there's concern about mental capacity. Uh, so as the uh, can made still be performed. Um, uh, yes, if the um, waiver of final consent has been signed, and it's uh, it's really the uh, the the first assessor or the provider it, to do their due diligence and really make sure that you, if you think your patient has any risk of loss of capacity to, uh, to uh, have that waiver signed. Um, and Dr. Woods can speak to having to come back a couple of times as well to ensure capacity. Um, I know there are yes. things that we worked on together where uh, she had to attend to the patient a couple of times to get a good assessment. It wasn't for a provision, but um, certainly just because their capacity is lost in that moment, if it's a delirium, there's potential they would be capable at another instance. And so MAID could still be performed in that circumstance. Yeah, I would say those situations don't happen a lot, but you have to be... Uh, aware that, you know, in this situation, as Dr. Ward was saying, uh, I went in to do my assessment and I was the second assessor and the patient had no idea who I was, why I was there. And the family was there and they just kind of looked at me and I, I'm like, I, I, you can see, I clearly can't do this assessment. And so I kind of took a breath and I went outside and I said, can you come outside? I'll, uh, I'll speak with you. And I spoke with them outside of the room and we just had a discussion. I said, what do you think's going on? Well, he was fine yesterday. He was fine this morning or he was fine last night. And we did a little bit of problem solving and realized that it was medication. He'd had a benzodiazepine the day, the evening before. And I said, okay, well, I'll come back this afternoon. I came back and he was clearing. I said, I'm not ready. I don't think he's ready to uh, be able to do this. I came back the next day and he was ready. And the family was so grateful as was the patient uh, that I just took that little bit of extra effort uh, to, um, to catch him when he was, uh, was able to give capacity and he was able, to, he did go ahead and receive uh, made. Thank you. 
Thank you. And Holly is asking the question, is there a plan developed to allow, encourage nurse practitioner involvement in assessing and providing MAID and as an independent practitioner, um, as in not part of their work role? And there's been a lot of discussion around this. I'm not sure exactly where it sits right now. I'm not sure, Amber, if you'd have more current information um, but just at, at this time, there is no way for nurse practitioners to bill independently. Um, but I do know that it is um, like under review. I guess I just don't, I'm just not sure at what level where it's at, but there is a strong group that is advocating for it. Um, I'm just not sure how much um, progress they've made. There is a nurse practitioner uh, in Southern Ontario, who's been doing MAID provision. She's a very strong uh, uh, leader uh, on CAMAP as well. And uh, she did them. I mean, she went above and beyond and was not paid uh, for a, a considerable number. Of, she wasn't paid at all. And I think she just recently received uh, reimbursement. Amber, do you know anything? No, I haven't heard anything else. Uh, that was uh, Willie Cranko, though. Yeah, and uh, so other than that, um, you know, like it, it really comes down to each individual organization and how is that nurse practitioner able to fit it within their role? Um, and does that, so number one, does your organization support you? Are they willing to allow you to take the time out of your day to complete one of these assessments? If it's a secondary assessment, you know, scheduling that within your regular workday. Um, but in the sense of, you know, nurse practitioners direct billing, um, I haven't heard of that yet besides that one case. Um, so one very strong advocate was granted that ability, but not province wide. Um, yeah, and I think she's ended up with a contract or she like it. She's not I don't think she's direct billing in any in any. I don't think it's built like that. Like, I think she's actually received like funding for a role, but it, yeah, everyone's watching very keenly because it has implications um, for many more that are interested, but. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna head on to the next question because we do just have five minutes left here. Um, if a waiver of final consent has been signed, then, oh, oh, this is Kat. I'm, I'm Thank answering, you. Yeah, I'm answering Tracy's question just so we can tackle the last couple that have been submitted. Maybe read it out because uh, perhaps people listening to the recording won't be able to have access oh, to it. Sure. And I think it would be a really beneficial answer. For sure. So the question is, can a substitute decision maker of an incapable patient at the time of made? override the consent for a patient that wished to proceed with MAID even if a loss of mental capacity occurs. So I interpret that to mean that the waiver has been signed and that the death is reasonably foreseeable. The patient deteriorated. So the idea would be that it could not be overridden by the substitute decision maker, um, that it's a clear and uh, capable decision that the patient made when they were capable. Um, it is, uh, also important to try to ensure that the substitute decision maker is part of the conversation about the patient's wishes. Uh, and I find that that very much helps either an independent phone call to say, are you aware of these wishes? What are your thoughts and feelings? Um, and also making it very clear to uh, the substitute decision maker that this is not their wish, this is the patient's wish. And I, I have said that directly to a patient's spouse is it's unfortunately not up to you, it's up to the patient. I think uh, there was also, uh, I'm just going back, we missed one question. Uh, do you support urgent requests for MAID, i.e. within one to two days? Uh, yes, we can, but it's extremely difficult and extremely stressful. Um, uh, pharmacies, the community pharmacies uh, can provide uh, the kit within 24 hours, uh, but it's the nursing support that's very challenging. Um, and to get two assessments done, find two assessors who are av available immediately uh, to do their assessments. And, and uh, it's, it's extremely difficult. It has been done, uh, but it's stressful. 
on everybody. So we, we, we tried to encourage, uh, you know, awareness early on in the process uh, so that it, we, we don't get in those situations. And then that kind of answers a couple of the, the remaining questions uh, that we also had submitted ahead of time. Um, can we be facilitated in rural hospitals? Um, and certainly it can, um, but it, again, it's just a matter of ensuring that the, the staff is available and the medications and supplies and, um, you know, just that there's time to, to put it together. Um, and then can maybe be done in the community setting or only in hospital uh, or hospice. And I think Amber had sort of touched on that. Um, in terms of um, the religious affiliations of some institutions, sometimes limiting the actual provision occurring uh, within that facility. But, you know, we just ensure we have good communication between everyone involved and, and work to, uh, you know, make sure the patient has the outcome that they are uh, requesting. So unfortunately, um, there's, there's, one, there's one final uh -huh. question, if I can give a quick answer. Uh, for a person who is not bedridden, considered fully functional prognosis of uh, three or more years is given, could they be eligible? Uh, yes, they can. It, uh, it's just part of the eligibility. They're dealt with in the same way, uh, reviewing the eligibility criteria. We have had uh, several individuals who've qualified on the basis of uh, extreme geriatric frailty, where they, as long as you can see a trajectory of decline and they have the uh, they meet the other eligibility where they have a, an incurable um, uh, disease and uh, the, the suffering component. So yes, it's possible. I want to take two seconds to answer the question just above about serious mental health and or addiction. So there can be an impact depending on the status of their mental health or addiction. It does not preclude them from ac accessing MAID as long as it is not the primary reason for accessing it. So sometimes you involve a psychiatrist to get their opinion that this is not an active or how active, how much is it impacting their decision um, as a safeguard, um, but it does not, if there is another reason they are accessing MAID necessarily preclude them from MAID. Okay, that was amazing that we got through all those. Um, thank you so much, everybody. And um, we did actually put together a couple of poll questions. Stephanie, would you be able to um, put those up now? I certainly can. We're just looking to get your feedback, um, what you were looking for today from this, this series and um, or from this Lunch and Learn and just to think about potential future education. So if you wouldn't mind taking a minute and just answering both, it'd be really helpful for us as a group. Um, look at them all pouring in. So we've got a lot of uh, general interest and um, quite a few about supporting conversations with patients or clients. So I hope today um, did that for you. And then we've got another another poll. Oops. Sorry, here it comes. <laughs> So we as a group, I think I can safely say that we're all open to being contacted to discuss, um, you know, your needs or your questions. Um, I think we were very happy to come together and put together, you know, this panel type discussion, but we're all also available as resources um, ongoing. I mean, that's, that's a big part of what we do. So I hope you found today really informative and interesting. And uh, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out in the future as needed. Thank you very much, Catherine, Amber, Michelle, Dr. Woods, Dr. Ward. Um, I too am amazed at the amount of questions and information that you were able to share in the last hour here. And I'm sure we could 
discuss much longer and with the continuing evolving legislation and changes, uh, we'll definitely be needing more presentations, I think. So thank you so much on behalf of the attendees um, and Sarah for taking the time to present today. Hi. Thank Fair you very much, everyone, for